This right here is what we're gonna build up to in this video, an animated approach to understanding a super important idea from psychology, learning. I want this to be an intuitive approach to the topic. And even for those who actually know how learning works, I still think there's something fun about visualizing the process. Psychologists have come to discover that our memories are really bad. And worse than that is our ability to process our senses. To put it into perspective, imagine inside this box is your entire sensory environment, things you can see, hear, and touch. From moment to moment, your brain can only really process up to about 2%. For our case, Let's say we're consciously trying to learn some introductory calculus. To be specific, the derivative. Taking a tour through the memory model, you'll see and hear information. This is called sensory encoding. During this phase, you'll listen to your teacher explain a concept about like seeing a slope sliding along a curve. This will then activate your working memory. In here, this is where all the action is happening. Your working memory is gonna have two feeders, the phonological loop, which encodes the auditory information and the visual spatial sketch pad, which encodes the visual information, both of which feed stuff through to the central executive. Now this guy has three main functions, to tune out irrelevant information, to switch attention from item to item, and to look into your existing neural network and link the new information with the existing. Now, before I move on with the working memory, there are a couple of things that deserve a lot more detailing. Firstly, What's a neural network? Let's visualize it. Think of each dot as a neuron and each line between the neurons as neurotransmission, which is really just a fancy word for the connection between each neuron. As more neurons become connected, you build what's called a neural network. And if it is a network containing facts, we call this a semantic neural network. The stronger the network regarding a particular concept, the easier it is to recall facts. Secondly, I mentioned the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad as the feeders for your working memory. These two feeders of information require different parts of your brain. So if you're looking to optimize the activation of your working memory, utilize both of these feeders. As to why this is the case, I suspect it's because you process visuals 10 times faster and you don't have to develop the abstractions yourself. Anyway, your working memory can typically hold on to information for about 10 to 20 seconds. Some of it gets stored into your semantic neural network and well, the rest is forgotten. And even with what gets stored, if it isn't strengthened, it's forgotten. And we know this thanks to a guy called Herman Ebbinghaus who discovered the decaying memory phenomena when he invented a new language and tried to memorize it, realizing he'd pretty much forget all of it. The quality of your working memory is distributed by luck. It's all genetic, some better than others. The better your working memory, the more information you can hold on to for a longer period of time. Also, people with a better working memory will typically have a higher IQ and ironically enough, a better ability to understand other viewpoints. So after we see and hear information, our working memory links it with an existing neural network. At this point, we should try to strengthen the network Strengthening takes place in the form of retrieval. Retrieval will work best when you're relying on your stored information. And when that's exhausted, you revise the initial sensory information delivered and just repeat the process. Now, just to make it clear, reciting the sensory information is not retrieval. Retrieval strictly relies on your stored information and requires actions that involve motor output rather than sensory input. For example, you could write, you could type or talk rather than listening or watching. In the case of learning introductory calculus, you could complete some textbook questions or explain the concept to a friend. And during this process, your brain will literally strengthen the neural connections and continue to build on that network. Of course, until you stop. If you don't use it, you lose it. Probably an expression you've heard before. You may have even experienced it like when you play your childhood instrument you haven't touched in 10 years. It's almost rude. You spend all this time building an interconnected network, practicing, retrieving, all for the network to just disappear. Well, it doesn't disappear, but something like this does happen. It's called neural pruning. Essentially, if you aren't actively building to the network, it'll weaken 
and paths kind of just cut off. However, you can always relearn many years later. Imagine you want to pick that instrument back up and learn the skill again, and you're having like a learning race against someone who's learning the skill for the first time, as in, the first one to master the skills of the instrument is the winner. You would absolutely destroy them. You see, the thing with neural networks is when you build them, they prune. However, when you want to rebuild the same network, it happens much, much faster than building it for the first time. That's pretty much it for consciously learning. You see stuff, forget pretty much all of it, so you try to recall it and strengthen what you know and repeat the process. Then when you've built an impressively connected neural network, you decide to do something else. That network that you've just invested all that time in building will prune away. But at least if you ever wanted to start doing that stuff again, you could relearn it at a fast pace. However, things get interesting when these neural networks build and you aren't consciously trying to do so. That is, neural networks are building in your brain that you aren't necessarily aware of. This was discovered by Pavlov and his dogs in 1905, for which he actually won a Nobel Prize for. Let's take a quick walk through the concept known as conditioning. Pavlov has a bell, which when he rings it, brings no response from the dogs. He also has food for the dogs. That makes them salivate. Pavlov would then feed his dogs while simultaneously ringing the bell, essentially pairing the two. After many iterations, Pavlov rang the bell and noticed his dogs were salivating, ready for food. The bell now became the conditioned stimulus which elicited a conditioned response. That is, something that should have no response, like a bell, now has the same response as something else, like seeing food when you're hungry. Let's consider this with people, not dogs. Conditioning with people can be particularly concerning because the initial stimulus is typically a thought rather than a bell. When you get a phone for the first time and you have no friends and you think about checking your phone, you probably won't have much of an emotional response. Independently, consider looking at your phone and seeing the flashing notifications. That probably makes you feel excited and you have an impulsive need to check it. Now, if you pair these two independent events, that is, thinking about checking your phone and then checking it and seeing a bunch of notifications, and then this happens repeatedly, what you get is a conditioned response. The thought of looking at your phone can give you an impulsive need to check it. You might see a possible problem arise from this. Not the fact that you're getting excited or an impulsive need to check your phone, but the fact that you thought of something and that triggered an emotional response. And that emotional response was delivered by a neural network that's been building in your brain while you weren't even aware. Anyway, that's enough of learning. If you made it through this far, then I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Also, if you like videos like this, then consider subscribing so you don't miss out any more of my psychology explainers that I've got coming up. And if you like these animations that I'm making and you wanna try and learn them and create some for yourself, I've got a growing list of tutorials and courses that you can check out right here on the channel. Anyway, thanks for watching.